South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and I Grow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. Somebody asked me when I would speak, and I said, right after everybody leaves. So <laughs> that's usually what happens then when you're the last speaker. Uh, it went from being too cold to too hot here pretty fast, so I don't know. Uh, the Coal Lakes Research Farm is uh, east of Pierce, South Dakota. We have both irrigated dry land. We're going to talk a little bit about what we do. I'm going to talk a little bit about where what we do started. And a lot of you may not know that we actually started a lot of this in the Jimmer Valley. Uh, the James Valley Research Center east of Redfield, we ran that for about eight years before we went to, to Redfield. And, and a little bit about the geology here is it's the Lacustrian Lake Dakota Plain. And what does that mean? It's an old glacial lake, that's why it's flat. It's very similar to the Red River Valley. And what happens in a glacial lake is when you get melting in the spring, you get a bunch of sediment comes into that glacial lake glacial time, this was a big lake, very large lake, and then the first thing that settles out is the sand, and then you get layers of silt and clay, and then next year you get another layer of sand, and then silt and clay comes out later, so you have this Oreo looking thing, if you take a soil probe and go out and poke a hole deep enough, you'll see all these layers, those layers are called barbs, and what barbs do is they make it very hard to make water go vertical into the soil because it has to saturate has to saturate that clay layer before the water will move into the sand. And then once it moves into the sand, it wets up that next clay layer, but that has to saturate before it moves into the next one. So it's very slow infiltration rate. But what we found when we started no-tilling is we got macro pores that took care of that. But if you want to run a vertical tillage machine across the top of that thing, you're going to plug that channel, just like everybody's been talking, Ray and everybody else. You plug that channel, and then that macro pore doesn't function anymore. So all this silliness that's happened since I left here, when we first brought no-till here. When I started at Redfield, there's 1,900 acres of soybeans in Spink and Brown County combined. Okay. And I almost didn't get my PhD because I made the statement I thought we could grow corn and soybeans in Jim River Valley if we just quit doing tillage. So, <clears throat> but we're not quite doing it right. So I'm going to talk about some of that today, why we're having trouble um, in there. Anyway, short-term studies are not accurate in evaluating treatments such as tillage or rotations which have long-term impacts. And too much of what we do is based on short-term stuff now. A farmer manages ecosystems and takes sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and makes them into products to be sold. Everybody gets hung up on being, would you turn me down? <laughs> <laughs> you just shut me off and I'm home. <laughs> we get hung up on being corn growers or wheat growers or soybean growers or cowboys or whatever. <clears throat> the thing we have to sell is sunlight. <clears throat> Period. That's what you're doing. You're harvesting sunlight and some water and the carbon dioxide. Nobody said anything about nitrogen and all those things, right? And we manage these ecosystem processes, the water cycle, the energy flow, the mineral cycle, and community dynamics. These are the things you're managing, not corn and soybeans and whatever. Those will do fine if you're doing fine with these. Uh, does rain feed plants and recharge groundwater? Does it run off and cause erosion and water quality degradation? You get the water to go in the ground and feed plants. If you don't have plants there, then it goes into groundwater. Drain tiles are great for getting salinity out of somebody's field in North Dakota and going to the Red River Valley, which runs north and goes into Lake Winnipeg and screws up somebody's lake cabin. That's a serious problem. You know, if you're going to put in drain tile, figure out where you're going to put the water. But if you got the salinity there because you're not managing your land right, why don't you take care of that instead of shoving your problem off on somebody else? Okay? Just whatever. 
Go Lake Research Farm began to use reverse low disturbance no-till cover property to control runoff under center pivot. And I think Mike Cronin's probably still in the room. These were Dan Cronin's pivots at one time, and he would mow work plow, because that's what everybody told him to do, and they put the water on and ran back in the river. And then when the price of energy went real high, and they wanted to use low pressure sprinklers, they couldn't do that anymore. They had to find a way to handle water better. We now can put on two inches of water in <clears throat> nine minutes and have no runoff. And if you've never been to Dakota Lakes in the summer, so you can walk behind us when we're irrigating, walk behind those irrigators and not get your feet muddy, you need to come and do that. But we did the same thing at Redfield on the custrian soils. Exactly the same thing with the same irrigators, basically. Okay? The reason is we have this surface residue, we have these macropores, and those take the water into the soil. Here is, mine isn't as good as Ray's. Ray showed a picture of this that was nice and clear, but this is Eileen Kladivko. This is where he got those pictures from. And they threw latex on some soils and then traced. This latex comes in and then hardens, and then they dig it out. So these are earthworm burrows. Here's earthworm burrows. Okay, and the water comes in there and then soaks into the soil sideways. So if you've got barbed soils, I don't know any pictures of barbed soils that are done this way, but you have these layers, and the water soaks in sideways into those layers. And this little earthworm didn't like to die. Uh, if you've got lots of, of worms that and, and termites and whatever that are making little macropores up here, and this, the transient burrowing worms do that, you get this kind of effect, and then the big ones have you going down in there like that. How much sunlight strikes green leaves and makes food for the ecosystem? What we're really trying to do is capture energy from the sun and turn it into this source of energy for the soil biology, which does all of our work for the ecosystem. And how much falls on dead vegetation and bare ground? And if it falls on dead vegetation and bare ground, then you start getting the saline seed problems. So we use cover and forage crops to find through crop rotations, increase carbon capture, sequester nutrients, fix nitrogen, and do a bunch of things. Encourage these friendlies, as Dan Porgy calls them. The, <coughs> the predators. We haven't had to use an insecticide in over 12 years at Dakota Lakes because we have all these predators that eat things. You know, dare, dare bugs to show up there, okay? We have to learn better ways of seeding the cover crops. That's a challenge in this area. This, we had a German intern this summer. If you want somebody that's really pro tillage, get a German intern. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty damn sure I was totally nuts. <laughs> Well, the first thing we did, right, Jay, is we sent him up to, to Jay Fures in North Dakota for a tour with a bunch of guys from Nebraska that were coming through, and that, they gave him a brain transplant, right? That was the first thing we did. And then, and then his job that I gave him was to make clay seed balls. Now, if you've never heard of clay seed balls, go home and Google One Straw Revolution. There's people in this world that farm without ever using a machine that cuts open the ground. They just throw these seeds that are co coated in clay and peat and whatever so they'll grow on top of the ground. They just throw them out on the ground. So they throw them into their wheat before wheat harvest and the cover crop starts to grow. And they throw them into the cover crop before they flood the field to grow rice and the rice starts to grow and then they flood and kill the cover crop. So we worry about going out and being able to take Jeremy, for instance, he's getting his big ass tractor stuck trying to seed, right? <laughs> if all we had to do is go out there and spread a bunch of clay seed balls out there with a four-wheeler, not a problem, okay? But we keep focusing on these little tiny things, so we're, <clears throat> we're gonna do more work with these, but that was his job this summer. Crop rotation allows time for natural enemies to destroy the passage into one crop while the only related crops are grown. When I came to Redfield in 1983, some of you weren't alive, quite a few of you weren't alive in 1983, 
We had a big problem in Jim River Valley with uh, Hessian fly. For you old guys, you remember that. We had all these Hessian flies just growing up our spring wheat. And we had breeding programs and insecticide programs and we're gonna get rid of Hessian fly. You ever hear about Hessian fly anymore? No, we started to rotate. One of the reasons I threw soybeans in is it fixed the Hessian fly problem. But we've been spending all this money in SDSU to try to kill the Hessian fly or have resistance to it. And all we had to do is go away and let the Hessian fly die on its own. Sequence is only one component of a rotation. Corn after beans is, is one sequence. But if you just do corn, bean, corn, bean, corn, bean, and your interval is always one year, then you get extended dipause corn rubber beetle like they have at Watertown, right? So crop rotations, proper intensity, adequate diversity, stable, sustainable profitability. Proper intensity means using the water. No-till saves water. That's a good thing. <coughs> But if you don't use that water, it makes the water go in the ground where it falls, if you don't screw around with map report, it gets more of it in the ground, but if you don't use it beneficially, then it gives you trouble. And what we've done is we're not really using that water like we should, so our intensity isn't right. Adequate diversity, you need enough diversity so you don't have all these weed problems. We should not have resistant weeds. It just doesn't make any sense that we have resistant weeds and stable and sustainable profitability. Native vegetation is the best indicator of the range of intensity which are appropriate for a location. This is a tall grass prairie. The Jim River is a tall grass prairie. So is the Red River. Both be growing these big, tall, warm season grasses with root systems that go 10, 12, 14 feet deep, okay? Most of the plant growth problems blamed on no-till are a result of inadequate diversity or improper intensity. It's not no-till's fault. You just haven't gotten the rotation right. You put this water you saved with no-till to work. Now what we do with it is try to grow crops first of all, and then if we, <clears throat> if we, and we do this with more high water use crops, cover crops, and double crops are the second thing. So we use more high water use crops. So we used to grow spring wheat barley, spring wheat barley, spring wheat barley in Jim River Valley. Maybe a little flax now and then. Can't grow corn. That's why they're going to build a, build, <clears throat> build a canal from the Missouri River all the way over the Jim River to put water here so you guys can grow corn and beans, right? The Wahi Project. Think how stupid that was. <laughs> <laughs> but I almost didn't get my PhD because I said, I think we don't need that. That we probably have enough water here if we use it better. Don't have to build that thing, whatever it was. Can you imagine this country all cut up with little canals? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but we can't always do it just with high water use crops. Corn beans, that's okay, but they're only growing three months of the year. We need these cover crops and double crops, and also need to go back and put some other lower intensity crops in there. Proper intensity reduces your risk. Are the nutrients available for plant use or environmental services? Or have they been leached, eroded, or transported from the landscape? Well, <laughs> leached means they go to saline seeds, right? Eroded, they run off or transported from the landscape, means they go in somebody's drain tile and go away. What's in a saline seed? He told you, it's a quiz. He just got done telling you. Calcium. Calcium carbonate, calcium sulfate. What's a common name for those? Lime and gypsum. The hefty boys will sell those to you. Right? The number one thing there, though, is nitrates. Right? They'll sell you those, too. And phosphates. 
go out in saline seas. They'll sell you those too, but why not keep them there? Okay, what's in <coughs> saline seeps is fertilizer. Don't say it's salt, say it's fertilizer. Start thinking of it as fertilizer. Okay? Ecosystems that leak nutrients become deserts. Saline seeps indicate leakage. Decreasing pH indicates le leakage. Somebody asked today, do you lose, do you use lime? If you have to use lime, it means you're losing lime because you're not cycling it well. Okay? A unitrine, another way to, to <clears throat> another way to lose nutrients is you ship them out. A unitrine of soybeans contains one million pounds of phosphorus. How many unitrines of soybeans go out of South Dakota every year? Everybody's saying we need more trains to get the grain out of here. And that's shipping phosphorus. We need more cows and chickens and pigs to eat the grain here so the nutrients stay here. Okay? And maybe those cows should be on the, <coughs> on the fields. So here's a, just like <clears throat> the last speaker. Rainfall comes in. If you're not using the water up here, it's going to seep out down here. Cover and forage crop provide this opportunity to increase its intensity and add to the diversity and situation for production of grain crop would not be possible, would be unprofitably, excessively risky. You can't grow a crop of wheat and a crop of soybeans in the same year at Aberdeen. There's not enough time, not enough moisture. Even with irrigation, we couldn't do it. Not enough time, okay? Couldn't do it well. So that's where cover crops come in. We were growing cover crops at the Redfield farm. Every year, when we harvested wheat or barley, we had forage sorghums and those kind of things followed. That was a standard operational procedure. That was almost 30 years ago. In human environments, tall grass, prairie, or wetter, which is here, the goal should be to have something growing at all times. In areas with limited growing season like here, it's where we require the use of cover crops or forage double crops. And I like the term forage crops, and that's what we used to call them. And that's really what we think they are. In subhuman, like we are, semi-arid, at pier, in arid environments, cover crops can be utilized to increase organic matter and biological activity. We don't use them as much on dry land out there because we're pretty marginal on rain sometimes. Okay? I stole this from Jeremy Wilson. Every time I say this, I credit you, by the way. I don't send you money, I just say it. <laughs> <laughs> Catch and release nutrients. I saw him do this a couple years ago. I just walked up after he gave the talk and said, I'm going to steal that. And that was it. <laughs> so here we look at the irrigated corn by previous crop. We had wheat, wheat, corn, corn, soybean, soybean rotation we use under irrigation. And we had a graduate student that was doing some work there. And we, we did some cover crop of lentils, chickling vetch, tur turnip after wheat harvest going to corn. And we had soil tests 108 pounds an acre nitrate nitrogen, yield goal 220 bushel an acre, which is pretty okay. With zero nitrogen, we got 176 bushel. With 36 pounds of nitrogen, we got 236 bushel. 80% of the air you breathe is nitrogen. And if we work at that, we can get nitrogen into the ground. And don't have to have it made with fossil fuels. Now, if you're going to sell your soybeans to China, you have to replace that phosphorus. Right? Because it went away. But the nitrogen comes back in the air, so you can sell nitrogen and bring it back in with your do the legumes and things right. And it didn't do us any good to add any more nitrogen. If you get stranded in the rain in the back 40, do you drive home across the tilled field or the pasture? Everybody said, oh, no, no till's too wet. <clears throat> If you have good soil structure because you're doing no-till right, you can actually drive on it and seed it before you can till ground. Trust me. 
Weeds and diseases are nature's way of adding diversity to a system that lacks diversity. And what we do and what you should do is counter this by adding beneficial diversity. And again, cover crops can play a role. Cover crops are a tool, they're not an end. We want to see at least three crop types. Long intervals of two to four years are needed to break some disease and weed cycles. Corn beans is a two crop monoculture. <clears throat> okay? Corn beans doesn't have enough carbon. The native prairie here was 80 some percent, 90 percent grasses, high residue crops. You can't put in half beans, half corn. There's just not enough carbon there to drive your system, and then you start shrinking your soil and water over capacity. Okay? So let's say that we look at a resistant weed issue, something like water hemp. What happens with different crop rotations? If you're doing a two-way rotation like corn bean and, and you control it one year out of two, <coughs> you look pretty good till about year seven and then you have 10 million seeds. If you do a rotation that's uh, two years out, wheat corn beans for instance, and you control it two years out of three, it doesn't blow up on you. If you're low disturbance, no till. Your high disturbance till whatever, then nothing works. Okay? If you want to be half <coughs> something, then two in and two out is better. So let's say wheat, wheat, corn, beans is better for wheat resistant type weeds. Uh, it doesn't blow up till about year 15. And here's some other thing. But if you're continuous, like you are with Roundup Ready stuff, where you're doing Roundup both years, you'll blow up in three years. My favorite story has to do with ALS resistance, pursuit. Way back years ago, we finally got pursuit for soybeans, worked great. And then they made what they called at that time Emmy corn, which we now call Clearfield corn. And I had a young producer say, oh, I don't have to worry about rotation anymore, Dwayne, because I've got emmy corn and beans I can break pursuit every year so every year I won't have a weed. And I said, well, you'll have resistant weeds. So I got a letter threatening a lawsuit because there's no evidence there was going to be resistance to ALS herbicide. <laughs> Think about that. Okay, 1994, a meeting in, in Denver, I predicted Roundup resistance. Monsanto never sent me a letter. I think they already knew in 94 it was going to happen. They didn't, they didn't admit it until the late 90s. Here's a wheat field that we never sprayed with herbicide and we left to skip. We don't spend a lot of money on herbicides. Not because of the rotation work well. But you need diversity. You need diversity in seeding date to do this. You also want the diversity in your rooting pattern and the root architecture to make your soil structure right. You want diversity in residue type. You want diversity in these insect pests, uh, weed suppression, microorganisms, harvest date, beneficial, etc. Okay? So let's talk about some rotation styles. And I've actually got a paper on our website, so you can go get this paper and explain all these. So we'll go through them fast. Uh, it's called agroecosystem management, is what it's called there. But simple rotations, winter wheat corn fallow, winter wheat corn canola, that kind of thing where it's, it's the same sequence and interval every time. Winter wheat always follows canola, corn always follows winter wheat, <coughs> that type of thing, right? It's simple, there's a limited number of crops to manage the market, but all corn is behind wheat and all winter wheat is behind spring wheat. Makes you vulnerable. The extended dipause corn rootworm beetle occurred because there's always an interval of one year between corn crops. What happened in the eastern corn belt? Because they have resistant corn rootworm too. Resistant to corn soybean. The, the pregnant females in Illinois, pregnant rootworm females, will fly from corn fields to soybean fields and lay their eggs. It's called the soybean variant. I called it the blonde corn rootworm beetle one time and got in trouble. 
Well, the blonde one was a smart one. She flew over there. If we put all our corn <laughs> into wheat stubble, we would get corn rumor beetles that flew to wheat stubble to lay their eggs. If everybody did that. Okay? Rotation with perennials. And this is the one I think you need to bring back. Grandpa did these. This would take care of your salinity problem. And <clears throat> that's where you do three or four years a, of perennial, and then you can do a stupid rotation if you want to. <laughs> right? Because corn bean, corn bean, corn bean, and by the time somebody catches on, you go to alfalfa for a while, or go to perennial grass for a while. Okay? Now, the problem is, <clears throat> the good thing is it's, it's still simple. It's an excellent place to spread manure. It can produce more soil structure and annual crops, especially if you're using grasses. And biomass crops may hold potential. If they're going to make ethanol out of something, it should be out of the perennials, not out of annuals. Not out of corn stalks. That's just degrading the soils even more. Okay? So we could do that. Uh, it's difficult to manage enough acres of land and perennial unless you're grazing. But you could graze that perennial phase. That'd be great. If you want beef, let's learn how to grow beef that way. Uh, harvesting 40% of your farm as forages is tough unless you're grazing. You got to have 40% of your land in alfalfa. It's just you're not going to get done. Uh, if you use less uh, uh, perennial than maybe 40%, it, it's going to minimize the impact. And this marketing thing is an issue. You got to get the farm government program to not punish you for doing the right thing. <clears throat> Compound rotations. What we do is we take. A rotation like spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, soybean, which is a simple rotation, and corn, soybean, which is a simple rotation, we stick them in the end. Okay, I call this my mother-in-law rotation. <laughs> spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, soybean, corn, soybean. Half my corn's in wheat stubble. Half my corn is in soybean residue. My mother-in-law comes to visit in June, I show her this corn. Find the soybeans. It looks really good in June. Don't harvest corn in June, but, <laughs> but it looks really good in June. If she comes back in August at Pier, I'm going to show her this stuff in wheat stubble, because it's going to look better. It's got more moisture. But it spreads a risk of wet and dry ears. Right? Give you some diversity. Soybeans always behind corn, that's okay. Winter wheat in the spring wheat, that's good. And you've got this big long break from corn and soybeans to kind of clean things up, and then you do the stupid rotation corn, soybean, corn, soybean for a couple of years and then come back. Okay? <coughs> Still have only three types of crops to manage. It creates more than one sequence for some crop types, like the wheats and the corn. Uh, you still have like three wheat workload days. Complex rotations where we start doing barley instead of spring wheat. We got, you know, different crop types, sunflower and soybeans and peas and all kinds of things. Um, we can really create a lot of conditions with all the different crop types. Lots of opportunity. It requires a lot of crop management marketing skill. But that's why we're paying farmers the big bucks is <clears throat> crop management and marketing. We don't pay a farmer to be a good driver, you got to auto steer. Right? Any damn monkey can drive a tractor now, even me. So you're not getting paid for being a good driver. And this is the one that's most interesting to a lot of people, because they like the name, Stack Rotation, it's an adolescent male thing. Um, <laughs> But what we do is we take two wheats, two corns, two soybeans. Why do we do that? Well, it creates a lot of diversity, even though we as humans look at it and say it's very predictable, but to a bug it's not. And there's a lot of things that happen there. It allows this sufficient time for pest pressure to decline, and that's really the, the goal is to leave these four-year breaks in there, right? <clears throat> Uh, we keep the pest population diverse or confused because corn rootworm, some of the corn is corn on corn, some of the corn is for your break. It doesn't know. It can't get in sync with us, right? Uh, mix a lot of long and short residual herbicide programs. 
First year corn, I put two pounds of atrazine down. Don't have to worry about carryover. Second year corn, I go ahead and use Roundup Ready. Well, at least I'm not using Roundup Ready two years in a row. Same way with the soybeans. I can put down a long residual thing like the old Scepter and some of those real cheap old guys in, in, in the first year because it's going to go back to soybeans again the next year, right? And it really is going to take care of uh, <clears throat> resistance and biotype change. It gives us a two-year break between the last corn and the first wheat if you're worried about head scab. Because it gives you that two-year break between the corn and wheat and, and when you do your first wheat. It, it redu reduces this risk of developing biotype resistance and it reduces the cost of herbicide programs a bunch. When I wrote this, I said not well tested. I have quite a bit of confidence in this right now. We've got a lot of guys doing that double wheat, double corn thing in the get us for beer area on their dry land and then throw in one broadly. Again, we want to be inconsistent in both sequence and intervals. When you look at a rotation, Mother Nature figures it out if you're consistent in either sequence or interval. Okay? Here's some other rotations I have. This one I always like to laugh about because I was in Kansas doing this one time. And one of the extension guys said, well, we've got a farmer. He does wheat, 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 until he gets joint goat grass. And then he starts planting sorghum. He plants sorghum every year until he gets uh, shatter cane. And then he plants sunflowers every year until he gets white mold. And then he goes back to plant wheat. And then everybody laughed. And I said, well, that's smarter than the guy in the corn belt doing corn bean, corn bean, corn bean, and calling up Monsanto every time something doesn't work. Right? So here's some that we use. Um, winter, we got wheat, wheat, corn, usually sorghum first, but it can be corn or sorghum, then another corn, and then one broad. This is one of our good rotations. 80% grasses, high residue crops. We throw some cover crops in when we get a chance. Uh, if we have one that's real low residue, like this one, half broad leaves, it fails. Okay. <clears throat> Irrigated, we've got a field that's been in continuous corn since 1990. We've got a field that's been in corn and soybeans since 1990. If you haven't been there to look at the soil difference in those two fields, you need to come. And as soon as you do that, you'll see why you shouldn't do corn and soybeans. Okay? And then we have these more diverse ones, like these, and these are our best, best rotations. There's no set recipe or best rotation. Individual fields may need differing treatment due to the difference in soils or location or proximity or history or landlord or ownership. You've got to understand how to do this stuff. But to show you the importance of the rotation, here's that low residue wheat rotation in a dry year <clears throat> where we have half low residue crops. Now this wheat followed peas, which followed corn in both rotations. The wheat follows peas, and the peas follow the corn. The difference is, in this rotation, we have a soybean before the corn. So it's soybean, corn, peas, wheat. Dry year, 2006. There's the same right across the road, winter wheat, same variety of winter wheat here. Uh, this is behind peas, that was behind corn, that was behind wheat. But it's wheat, corn, beef. There's not that extra broad leaf in there. So it's 66% high residue. The other one is 50%. There's it looked like from the air. Okay? Aerial photos. So <clears throat> here's the yield. 2006 dry year, 60 bushel wheat in that high residue, the low residue of that extra soybean, 29. We had 7.9 inches of rain from the time we harvested the peas until we harvested the winter wheat that year. The next year, 2005, or the year before 2005, we had 23 inches in that little over a year. Uh, 92 versus 57. And in 2002, 56 versus 28 on 6.4. See? Organic matter makes a difference. Let's look at some irrigated stuff. Corn soybean rotation, 2013. Cover crops historically increased our soybean yield by 7.3 bushel an acre, where we put cover crop behind corn going to soybeans. This would be a winter cereal. 
uh, <clears throat> we didn't have any non-cover crop stuff. So in 2013, soybeans with cover crop was 62.9. We would have expected about 55 without the cover crop. And then in this rotation, corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, first year soybean yield. Now notice that we've, we've got this two year break in here. This is important. Uh, no cover crop, 73.6 bushel, second year soybean, which is this guy, 82.1. Look at the difference in yield just by slapping that rotation apart a little bit. In soybeans, the reason you have trouble with soybeans, you got them every other year. If you read the book when you're in agronomy school, it should be any more often than every four. <clears throat> so, cover crop for us increases the yield 7.3 bushel, but a more diverse rotation increases by 15.9. Right, 62.9 versus 78.9. Eight when I average of two years of soybeans in this rotation. Average of this one and this one. So, how about corn? I've got a field that's been in continuous corn since 1990. Interesting. 203 bushel. Corn, soybean in, in 2013, 217. The average of these two is 235. The second one's about 217. The first one is more. Up in the 250s. So, if I did 5,000 acres of continuous corn, I'd get a million bushels of corn. I'd also have feed combine, lots of trucks, and help it help big dryer, and all those things, right? If I'm going to have a million bushels of corn. If I did corn soybeans, I'd have over a half a million bushels of corn, because it's better yielding. I have this many, 157,000 bushels of soybean. If I did this one, I, on 40% of my acres, I'd have almost half as much corn as here. See, because the yields get better. And my soybean yield is more. It's, it's, it's the same. See, this is interesting. 40% of my acres give me the same yield or more yield than 50% of my acres here. See? And I get this wheat for free. So let's look at if we had 2,000 acres and put numbers on it. I can't remember when I did this, but it took out a number. It's about four dollars more at that time. So it's not it's not that good right now, but the, the, the differences stay the same. 1.5 million on 2,000 acres. Corn soybean, I get 1.5 million on 2,000 acres. Actually, a little less than here. But the, but the costs are a little lower, probably. If I do this rotation, I get 1.7 million on 2,000 acres. And in this one, I get 1.6. So these two are making me more. People say, I can't do wheat because it doesn't make as much money. Well, I don't find that. That's not what I'm finding. And these are cheaper corns and beans to grow. <clears throat> okay? Now, if I really do it right, I can only do 2,000 acres of corn and get it done in time. That's 1.5 million, 1.6 million. If I, I can do 4,000 acres of corn soybeans, because I got more, got different windows, so that makes 3 million versus 1.5. If I do this one, I can do 5,000 acres because I got this wheat I can plant, so that's 4.3. And if I do corn, corn, soybeans, wheat, which is another one we do, it's 3.4 or 3.5. So saying you can grow, can't grow wheat because it doesn't make any money, it does. Diversifying it gives you a chance to do cover crop and really do some things, okay? So, how much per acre? Continuous corn average 7.99 grows per acre. Corn soybean 7.73, this rotation 8.72, and this rotation 8.73, but these are on way more acres, so I have a lot more Vegas money. Years ago, when I first started going to Argentina, they did seven years of pastures and seven years of cropping. Years ago, when I was a kid, my grandfather and father used to put perennial sequences into their crop rotation. And grazed and made hay and did that kind of stuff, and then put it back to crop production. And the Argentines did that, and in their rotation, when they did crop, they usually had cover crops in there. This was without, and this was with. But this is what the soil looked like when, when Ray talked about cottage cheese. 
If you talk about healthy soil, I mean, talking about healthy soil is like talking about beautiful women. <clears throat> you can't really define them with words, but we all know one when we see one, right? <laughs> so this is one. And then they outlawed the sale of the export of beef in Argentina. Can't export beef anymore. So the guys had to quit doing cattle on that extent because they couldn't export to beef. That's one of the reasons our beef prices are so high. And so they had to do, start growing soybeans on soybeans with just a little corn now and then. And then that same soil, that same spot, now looks like this. And that was in 2010. This was in 1996. 2010. Organic matter makes a difference. With all, all textural groups, as organic matter increased from 1 to 3 percent, available water capacity approximately doubled. When organic matter content increased to 4 percent, and then account for more than 6 percent of total available water holding capacity. With corn, soybeans, you're mining organic matter. Your water holding capacity is going down. So when you get a big rain, your bucket's smaller than it used to be. When Grandpa broke this ground in the Jim River Valley, it probably was 7 or 8 percent organic matter. And number you'd accept tasting. Yeah. Now what do you have? Think of this number here. So instead of holding 12 inches of water in your soil, you're now holding six. So when you get a big rain, you're wet and the salts come to the top and all this stuff. You gotta build that organic matter, that bucket back up again. Grandpa mined it. Okay, now we gotta fix it a bit. Okay, the other thing is where you have the perennial sequences, you suck the water out below you down to 12 or 14 feet in a dry year. So when you do get a wet year, there's a place for that excess water to go. Right now, you, you're running with water tables at three and four feet all the time. As soon as you get a wet year, you're, you're wet. You don't have any room that's been sucked out down below. The soil water storage capacity is low. Much of the rain that falls during extended periods of precipitation is lost or causes a problem. In contrast, the high water storage capacity combined with the effective capture of rain and snowmelt with macropores over the fall, winter, and spring can support a cops during an extended dry period because you have a big bucket. So, this is an Argentine drill. We've got a really good opener. We're making that into a real drill. But look how low disturbance that is. And as this crop dies and feeds nutrients to the wheat that grows. It's captured a bunch of nitrogen that's going to feed the wheat. Now when I had a Chinese trade delegation there, they said, well, that means you don't need to use fertilizer. And I said, well, yeah, I do. If I'm going to sell you the wheat, I need to replace that phosphorus unless you're willing to go into your sewage sludge and load some containers of poop up and send it back. And they got this real, once a translator translated, they all like, like this, you know, and then, <laughs> then all of a sudden, like, boy, I'm not going to go in the diplomatic corps. And then all of a sudden they thought about it, and they all started making shoveling things and laughing, see, because they, they understand that in China. In the old times in China, if you went to somebody's house for supper, the polite thing to do was to go to the bathroom before you left because you're going to take nutrients home with you and you need to leave some to replace the ones you're taking home. Hmm. Well, this is true. They <laughs> <laughs> did it in Korea, too. What? They did it in Korea, too, when they were there in the 50s. Okay, see? All tillage tools destroy soil structure. All <laughs> tillage tools decrease water. I don't care, vertical tillage, whatever the hell you want to call that stuff. It's tillage. All tillage tools reduce organic matter, and all tillage tools increase weeds. <clears throat> tillage is to agriculture what fracking is to petroleum. What tillage is designed to do is to increase the speed and extent of the nutrient removal from the soil, just like fracking increases the speed and, and extent that you can remove oil from shale. And it leaves the resource degraded. So if you're in the mining business, tillage is good. And that's kind of what Grandpa did. He came to native stuff and he's mined it. 
But then he put perennial back in and built it back up again. And then he mined it again, and then he built it back up again, and then he mined it again. And what we're doing is we're just mining it. <clears throat> Continuous low disturbance, no till, in combination with diverse rotation and cover crops is a biological answer to a biological problem. We look backward when we do tillage, we look forward when we're doing no till. Thank you. Well, the only way to put nitrogen, and I didn't show the data, but the only way to put nitrogen on corn is to place it three inches to the side and at the same set depth as the seed when you're planting. Well, it's cheaper to equip your planter to do that than to buy an air seeder. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you're going to wear it out faster. It's just not even close. Every bit of, I can show you all kinds of data, it's at least 20 bushel different. I mean, I, I've done this over and over and over again. There is 20 bushel difference if I put fertilizer three inches to the side versus anything else I do with it. Yeah, it is. <coughs> they're only in the seed or over it. I know. Yeah, they're not over it. Yeah, they're not over But do they test it again putting it three inches to the side? Because the other thing you do when you're just broadcasting or going out and putting it out in the fall, it's the wrong time, first of all, it can get, get lost. But the other thing you're doing is you're feeding the weeds. One of the big keys to our weed control being cheap is we're putting our fertilizer on so it doesn't, our crops get it, but our weeds don't. So you're feeding the weeds, and they go, that's okay, I can kill them. But you really can't kill them anymore, but yes. What about side dressing? Well, side dress is okay, other than I'm in 20 inch rows, and that, that's tough. We, we, we still want that starter on the corn plant to get the big corn in June, get it off to an early start. Because one of the problems with no-till is that the nitrogen doesn't come free as fast as the no-till because it's cooler, which is good, because it comes free later, but we've got to give it that jump start. And that's, you know, that's why we get that big difference. But, uh, on our irrigated ground, we just put the nitrogen on some of it with the corn planter rest goes for the irrigator, which is basically side dress. But on dry land, we put it all out at the planting time. What about foliar spraying? Uh, plants have a root for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Mother Nature never fertilized on the, on the... The only place for a foliar is, is to try to, to ding up your... raise your protein on spring weeks and stuff like that. You can modify, you can do some things with foliars on spring weeks to try to bump their protein up a bit. But that's the only one that I think makes any sense. You've got healthy roots. See, one of the things with bad rotation, you've got shitty roots. So you don't really explore. Yes, way back in the back there was one. Three inches over, that's pretty much your sweet spot. Well, three inches is outside of where the two inch, two and a half inch depth wheel of the planter goes. So if it happens, if that single disc fertilizer opener happens to peel up a little bit of mud or something, you're not getting it on the depth wheel. And it's far enough out, you never, you never really have any dink, so I can go as high as I want to on the urea. Urea, ammonium sulfate stuff that goes in there and goes as high as I want, variable rate in it, and get really high. Well, okay, so when you go to your no-till drill, like your you know, basic job here, where do you want to well, but okay, and wheat it's a different thing, so that five inch off is the right answer for, yeah. for wheat. Because if you give too much nitrogen to wheat early, it, it makes too many tillers. And, and if you ever look at a wheat plant when it's mature, the first head is big and the next head smaller and the next head smaller yet. So, <clears throat> Ruth ran away on me. Ruth did her master's degree stuff at Redfield, starting this high yield wheat thing where we, we plant heavy and manage the nitrogen to try to keep from tillering and all that kind of stuff. And she, she started that there and we've had people that continue it and that's kind of how we manage the nitrogen is to try to, try to five inches off is about right. But that fertilizer place, but then on a no trail drill, put it in the seed trench is probably is not a good idea. Put a little phosphorus in the seed trench, but not nitrogen, no. You gotta get it off the side. Yeah. 
Yeah, and if it's too close, if it's three inches, it's too close that wheat gets it too fast and still tillers quite a bit. Corn's bred not to tiller. And you can breed, you can breed wheat not to tiller, but we don't have any of them in the United States. They have them in Europe, they're called unicorn weeds. One seed gives you one hit, just like corn. And that's why they have the real high yields in Europe too. You're gonna get the same thing with oats and things like that though too, aren't you? Do same thing with oats. Yep. What kind of uh, starter fertilizer do you use? The starter will use either a MAP or a MES, or a, you know, a MES is the one that's got the zinc in. So for corn, I'll... On 1034, oh, you can you, you, you drop the zinc in. Yeah, or 1034 is the other one you put the, the zinc with it, that's the other one you can do. The reason the MES is better than using a, a zinc sulfate in a starter, zinc sulfate, you just wouldn't have enough particles. You'd have a particle here and a particle there and a particle there, whereas a mass, it's a little bit of zinc on every particle. And there, there's 40 rocks, it's got the same thing. It's, it's not just the one people that make it, there's more people that make it. What about fertilizer with the seed in planting corn? Well, when we plant corn, we put a little bit of phosphorus with the seed, but not the nitrogen. But if all you're doing is just the phosphorus with the seed, that's, that doesn't give you the pop. You get your response actually from, in long-term no-till, you get response from the nitrogen, not from the phosphorus. It's really interesting. Dwayne, what do you think about, uh, uh, you know how by here we have a lot of trouble getting a lot of growth out of our cover crops on account of the dryness behind wheat? Yep. Uh, what would the merits be of in a year where we're just going to be practicing farming for profit, if we if we just decide to go a full season cover crop, well, we he what he asked was what what if we just do a full season cover crop? One that we did with Cronin Farms and, and Mike Cronin's here, we did one last year as part of that Buffett thing where they did oats pea early, harvest that for hay, and then they did uh, pearl millet and German millet together, is that right, Mike? And then they had some kind of a broadleaf in there, or supposed to have. As your second crop, so you have two forage crops, and then they swath that, that second crop, and they swath trace that. And, and, and what they were supposed to do, but they didn't do, but whatever. They're supposed to bring the oats bales back out, put them across, so the swaths are running this way, you put the bales this way, and then you use the bales to hold your wires as your frontal graze. You, stick the bales in the posts in the bales and then put your wire across and then all you have to do is move to the next row of bales and you expose, or a half a row or whatever, but you expose some bales and just keep moving to the next row of bales with your, with your wire so you have a balanced diet out there of oats and peas and hay millet, and whatever. And the cowboys kind of like that, right, Mike? The swath grazing? Yeah. <laughs> They were the ones that were supposed to move, put the bales out there, and they didn't. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't like that part. But, but I mean, it, it, those kind of approaches. They, the Canadians do this a lot, so it's not they can't do it where the weather's bad. Because and the reason that they did it before we were doing it is because they had the BSE problem. Like an old cow in Canada is worth a dime a pound. So they really can't sell them. I think they're getting so they can now, but. Ten years ago, an old cow there was worth ten cents a pound for dog food, and that was it. So they had to figure out some way to take a lot of costs out of their cow calf operation. They do it with swath grazing and bale grazing. If you've got salinity in the low ground, and and you can put a cover crop out there or whatever, and then bale up swath or bale up or swath the high ground, bale up the low ground, and take that salty bale from the bottom and put it on top of the hill. And then, then do this kind of thing. See, so now you've got your salt going back to the top of the hill where it came from, right? So that one makes a lot of sense. And if you got salinity, put in perennials. That's going to fix it pretty fast. You know, put in four or five years of perennials, fixes it. But it's been fun. Thanks.